that's another reason why I wanted to have this actually captured in reality because the water reflections are always less vivid than reality. Today, our guest is Christine Lashley. Christine, hello, hello, hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. So, Christine, I would like to find out where people are. You're in where? I'm in Reston, Virginia, which is just outside of the D.C., greater D.C. area. So, yeah. Okay. And what's life been like for you during COVID times? Oh, well, you know, every day you kind of reinvent yourself. But overall, it's been pretty good, Eric. I have to say, uh, I've been in the studio creating more larger pieces. That's why I decided to kind of showcase one today. And um, I feel really lucky that, uh, I mean, most people know me kind of as a plein air painter. And so doing some of the larger works for um, a gallery show or something like that, it, it's actually led to some commissions and um, people looking at bigger pieces. So that's been a positive and yeah. So I'm rolling with it. So uh, tell us a little bit about what you're gonna work on today. Yes, well, I have uh, a smaller painting. It's a 20 by 30. And uh, there's somebody who wants a 30 by 40, which is behind me. And so I rarely um, do exactly the same painting. So you could see the, yeah. the, the smaller one there and then the bigger one, which I'm gonna work on. And they wanted fish in the koi pond. And uh, so that's what I'm gonna work on today is showing people how the water gets blocked in. And behind me, what you can see is kind of a watercolor start uh, done with water mixable oils. And it's, it's very loose, very flowy. And then I'm gonna put some direct paint on that and show people how to do that with traditional oil solvent free. Okay, so you you started with water mixable oils, and are you gonna the the solvent free? You're gonna use regular oils. Regular top? oils, I know. It's like why do I make my life harder? But I like traditional oils have uh, a longer dry time. I find a little bit longer dry time, so I can manipulate them longer, and also they're just really creamy and very luscious, and I haven't. I don't know. It's I've done paintings where it's just water mixable oil, but there's just the subtle thing that just I don't know. This is my this is my deal, so I'm sticking with it. It sounds complicated, but it's you not. You can't get that watercolor underpainting effect that you're getting with um, with regular oils. I don't think. I mean, maybe you could, but I think with water you'd mixable, you can't. You, Eric, you'd have to use a lot of solvent, and because I don't use solvent, that's that was the one thing with the water mixable oils is, uh, you know, how do you, like, it just was such an easy thing to start your painting that way. So it's just great. Well, this is going to be fun because uh, we have had uh, we had a guest recently who, who did their underpaintings in acrylics. We had another guest who did their underpaintings in in and regular oils. Now we're gonna get another viewpoint on underpaintings. And, and I've got a little video I'm gonna show of you doing that that underpainting. And then uh -huh. we'll get into it in just a minute. Okay, sounds, sounds great. Like fun. Thank you. So Christine, you. Uh, tell us a little bit. You've been on, uh, you, you've been doing some videos on a pretty consistent basis with Scott Christensen. Can you tell me about those? Yes, we're doing a project called Beyond the Easel. And we, we want to kind of, uh, think outside the box. We have some artists that are on the show. And uh, the idea was just um, I, some people would say, oh, you know, I, I love artistic conversations and these are great. Why don't we have these more often? And we thought it's so sad that now with COVID, everybody's in their own space. And we just wanted to bring that to the public. And that's how the idea started. And we've just kept going because we've had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it is fun. I mean, you, you've done like 20, 25 of them so far, right? Yeah. And what's your publishing schedule? Do you have a particular schedule that you publish? Uh, for now, we're doing, we, we were doing webinars and it was every week. And that was kind of when COVID was starting with uh, the numbers and everything was shutting down. And we thought, well, we're in our studios anyway. And, uh, but now we're down to, uh, we've, we've spaced it out to uh, two times a month. 
is it's every other Wednesday is what we're releasing them. Just well, now. you know, people don't realize how much work it is to do something like that. Uh, it's it takes a lot of preparation, getting the guests and, and getting everything together. It's it's a lot of work. So thank you for doing that. They're yeah, they're fabulous. We're doing it. Yeah, we're doing it as a volunteer project. So it feels good to to be able to do that. So uh, before we begin, what you're going to teach us today, I I want to I want to uh, do a couple things. First off. Tell us a little bit about when you did this painting and this video, what, what can people expect on that video? Sure, Eric. Um, the, the idea is basically how do you get maximum drama in your painting? And uh, of a city scene that you see, oftentimes if it's a sunset that you took a picture of or something dramatic, there's just something lost with the photography and not to diminish the power of photography of course we all take a lot of pictures but it's basically how to tap into that feeling that you had of the dramatic scene the blaze of the lights and and so i walk you through not just the nitty-gritty of how to make a good city scene i show you perspective uh, there's there's tips and techniques to just getting started doing cars and figures and so i have little exercises for that um, but also you could take this idea of creating this dramatic scene, which happens to be a city scene and does happen to have perspective and cars and people, but you could use that for a landscape um, very easily. That same type of idea of just extracting drama from your scene. So there will be a little bit, uh, you're going to get a, a, about an hour sample of Christine today from Painting Sparkle. And, and I don't remember the full length of the video, but it's pretty long. I think and, it's like five and a half hours. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's 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 an art course in itself. And and uh, so that'll be on today. Now, tell us a little bit about this new video that you just released. Yes. Well, in the in the sparkle video, I go a little bit more into um, extracting that drama, like I was saying. So I almost thought of that as like a value video. And this one is really about color. And of course, I still talk about value. That's very important. But I also wanted to I get a lot of questions uh, from my students about, well, how do you even see something plein air? I, they, they want help just um, detangling the scene. What should I paint? How should I choose what I'm going to paint? And that, again, that idea of uh, zooming in on what your idea is all about. So I coach people on how to refine that idea finding process, finding your scene, on location or maybe in the studio, either one. And uh, we have some footage outside, which was really exciting. I, we had a freak frost, so <laughs> all the water lilies died, but I managed to get some other footage for that. So, so we had some <laughs> um, creative things happening on the video, but it, it, it happened for sure. And now, um, you, you, you have a new book out um, mm -hmm. and, and tell us about this new book. Well, that was for my show that just opened this past weekend with Principal Gallery in Charleston. And I decided it was time to put out a new book. And the last one was very well received. It's basically just my paintings that I've done for the past two years. And it was kind of nice to put it together because I thought, well, hey, the, the, all these plein air trips that I'd been on and studio paintings that I've done. Plus, I find this is a good tool for uh, collectors and students um, to see like maybe what I was painting while I was on location. And I have some text in there and, and again, what I was thinking as I was on location. So I think it's important for people to know that it's not just the picture. There's other things that are going on in yeah, the artistic and, creation process. And I have your first book, which is probably also on your website uh, christinelashley.com slash books. Is that right? It is, but that one sold out. So this one's brand new. Oh, and, uh, yep. And I have, uh, like 500 copies. So okay, <laughs> well, well they'll be sold out. Uh, so they'll be sold out by the end of today. You guys <laughs> get them while you can. This is the problem that is that, you know, when, when we're on here, people keep selling out of things. I mean, people are, you know, hearing from lots of people from all over the world and they're grabbing it. So you guys, if you want that book, go to christinelashley.com slash books. All right. So um, I want to see, let's see, you gave me a video that you wanted me to show. Is that you want to talk, uh, do a little bit of setup for that first? Yeah, I'd like to. Um, the 
the idea here is water reflections. And I find that that is uh, kind of a buzzword in workshops. Everybody feels like, what is that thing about water reflections? So that's one point to make about what you're gonna see today. And then the next is that I paint totally solvent free. And in the beginning of this video, you see uh, my reference photo and the painting that you can see behind my shoulder, there's one that's finished. And uh, then basically the underpainting and uh, the pond still has the underpainting, which was done in water mixable oil. And that water mixable oil is just so wonderful. You could wipe out, there's no Gamsol, there's no fumes, there's nothing toxic whatsoever. I don't mind if I get my hands dirty with it. And I use transparent oxide and French ultramarine blue. Sometimes I use cobalt. I might change the colors that I use, but predominantly I like that mix of warm and cool. And uh, basically then I start with direct painting and you could either completely use the water mixable oils that there's many manufacturers that have uh, great products. I have just been using traditional oil. It gives me a little bit more wet painting time. Um, and, and so I just find that I enjoy that because quite simply I can manipulate the paint just a little longer. So you're gonna see me paint with traditional oil. I did this yesterday, so. Okay, it, well I'm gonna go ahead and run wet. it and, and I think you can talk over it. Okay. Yeah, so this was Giverny, um, Monet's Garden in France, and this was the painting that I did. And uh, here I am starting it. You can see I have the painting there for reference. It's interesting that this painting, I've done about five commissions from this painting, but I, that, that painting maybe is the wrong size for the majority of people, I don't know, but people are ordering bigger paintings from it, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> So when you do a uh, when you do a commission, do you try to make e each one is a little bit different, or what? How are you dealing dealing with that? Yeah, there's no painting is ever the same. Even if uh, in even this, if yeah, this one is going to have koi fish in it, and um, I'm probably going to change the flowers and the lilies will probably d be diminished to some degree because I really want to be able to focus on the fish. And so what I'm gonna show viewers today is um, the water. And you can see here, anything that's melting or dripping, that's just water. I use a spray bottle um, to just spray that down and I'm able, I'm wiping out here. So I'm able to get back to the weight of the canvas very easily. And uh, it's, there's, here I am wiping out again. And sometimes there's a little stain. Okay, so now I've mixed big piles of color and I'm just blocking in I can, it's very handy to have, you see my studies that are above the computer. Those are some plein air studies that I've done in gouache and watercolor and also that painting. So I could just hold up the palette knife and mix these big blobs of color as I go along. And uh, so this is, I wanted to at least do the background because water reflections are a lot easier if you establish what is happening in the background because and I'll talk about uh, the science a little bit of water reflections when I'm painting for everybody. Uh, but it is important to, I say, paint reality first, and then your water reflections are gonna be easier. And it's tempting with such a large expanse of water to just dive into painting that water, but I need to understand where my colors are and my value scale. Um, this is so, this is medium and dark is how I would, classify that background, you know, the reality, like the forest on the garden edge. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we get started? Okay. Sounds All good. Right. You just All light right. up like a Christmas tree when you get to paint. <laughs> I know. Uh, okay. I hope everybody could see this. Okay. The lighting in here, it's hard to light a big painting evenly. Now, All right, one well, thing that we, we can already tell is when you're facing away, it's harder to hear you. So you're going to have to kind of figure that out. Okay, thanks for the reminder. I will definitely do that. Um, right. the, the plan is this, I have these big mixes of color and you can already see some swatches on here. So I- How dry is that? Uh, this, this is uh, 40, so 40 by 30. No, how dry? Oh, this is, um, this is all wet. I did this yesterday. Okay, still wet. And just to show you with the water mixable oil, I mean, I could still lift out areas if I wanted to. Okay. Um, not that I necessarily wanted to do that, but <laughs> it's okay. 
I'd but rather show you guys how it works. I think that's important. All right. Yeah, just remind me if the sound cuts out. I know that's, um, you know, here's the mic and there's the painting. So I'll, yeah. I'll roll with it. Okay, roll with it. Someone is saying they're inspiring you to use water soluble oils. I mean, yes. you're inspiring them. It's so it, it's so liberating to be free of that solvent. Okay, you guys, reminder that we have prizes for comments, and so make sure you you leave comments. At least tell us where you're from, uh, especially if you're outside of the states. We'd love to know where you're from, but we want to know anyway because we, if we give you, give away a prize, it's nice to be able to say, "Oh, it's so and so from so and so," right? Okay, so the premise of creating a water reflection is that I want to create, I want to mimic this dark mass. I want to basically drop my hand down here and actually create that shape again. And if I have a tree that's leaning here, it's going to reflect in the water. the opposite. It's going to reflect this way. And I know the camera is a little tilted, but um, hopefully everybody could understand yeah, that. Bit. We get it. So this vegetative mass is going to repeat here in the water. And there is a confusing thing that happens. And I'll just show you in my final painting. You can see that the vegetation is reflecting as purple and a little bit darker. So you have to, overall, the water is a medium or dark value, and then those lily pads are light. So that is definitely what I'm thinking of as I'm creating this painting. So are you making it darker than what your eye actually sees? I just wanna maintain the value structure. This, this value right here, this is gonna be hard to capture on just the webcam, but I was very careful when I mixed my colors that this, in fact, is going to be lighter, and this is a bit darker. And I'll explain that too. So that's another reason why I wanted to have this actually captured in reality, because the water reflections are always less vivid than reality. And that just means that anything dark is going to reflect lighter, and anything light is going to... Uh, I said that wrong. <laughs> Anything light is going to reflect darker and anything dark is going to reflect lighter. So the formula that I think of is it's always less than. So if let's just say I have a bright red flower here or somebody in a red jacket, this can't reflect as red. You have to kind of incorporate that into what is happening. And that could be a red uh flower on the shore or something like that. Uh, so that idea of less than I think is pretty important. So why are you using palette knife instead of a brush? Uh, this is just to get, I, I like um, working with really greasy, just full paint. And this is because I'm, they, there's a, uh, museum directors and conservators say that it's better to have full paint that is created all in one wet. So also I'm doing a couple of things here, creating a more um, archival surface than if I built this up through layers with Gamasol um, because solvent is, so I'm, I'm, I'm in essence avoiding that uh, solvent, Eric. So there's a question about water soluble oils and I, I think it's a little different than from what you're doing because you're taking water soluble oils and then you're putting regular oils on top of them. The question is that he used water soluble oils, they stayed wet for a few days and he could still wipe the painting down with water. Do you have to varnish them? Well, I, I, I guess I think the first thing is like all oils, you got to give it plenty of time to dry before you varnish it. What, what is your answer to that? Do you have one? Yeah, you you want to basically make sure it's going to dry for enough time, uh, for sure. 
And um, truthfully, if too much medium is used with the water mixable oils, I just like with the regular oils, you shouldn't use too much medium. That's another thing I'm doing here is direct painting. So in general, I wait like six months to varnish a painting. So what do you do if you've got a, like you're in a plein air show or you have something that you don't have six months, you just sell it unvarnished? So, uh, right? you, can, you can do just a light, um, just a very light coating of the varnish because usually Retouch. things will tack up and uh, in a really hot car, you can kind of bake your paintings. And I've I've done that before, but you, the traditional varnish is three layers. So if you go out to Christine's driveway, you'll find paintings baking in the car. <laughs> you just need to get some big pizza ovens. Um, so are you, your paint seems pretty thin. Is it straight out of the tube? Uh, this is straight out of the tube, yeah. Do you ever put anything in it to thin it, like linseed oil? Sometimes I use a little bit of uh, Gamblin solvent free gel. Okay. And um, that, uh, because that has uh, some type of alkyd properties, that also at a plenary event will help me have that dry. Help it dry okay, let me dry. describe also what I'm doing here with the water, which is I've, I've blocked in where the foliage is. And, and you can see a lot of examples of these water paintings on my website. Um, I got very inspired visiting Monet's gardens in Giverny. And it's, I wanted to show this stage too because it's a little bit of a mess, but, and also I tell my students in the beginning, it almost looks cartoony. Don't be afraid. You're maintaining value, you're maintaining your structure. If you know where the painting is going, I mean, don't forget, I have a plan here. It's great that basically the study is super large so you guys could see it. I think I that, have a picture of that. Let me just see if I can pull that up real okay, quick. Okay, yeah. There, there, you can see. That's nice. You can see them kind of side by side. You can see one is straight on. So, Christine, and uh, somebody's asking, do you have a particular varnish brand that you use? Uh, yes, uh, Kmar uh, UV Archival. It's a spray varnish. It's real easy to use. Right. Archival is very important. Yeah. So what I'm doing here um, is basically I'm going to go from this like a purplish blue and this is darker. So, so I'm also going to be thinking about the arc of the sky because if the, the elements that measure is this bank of foliage. So I know this bank of foliage at least reflects to here. So this is basically sky that would be way up off of the camera, off of the painting. And what I want to do is because this is sky, I want to start having this fade because I, I need to reach this color. So I want to have a fade from this darker bluish purple to this color here. For it to be a convincing sky. Exactly. So now I'm going to be mixing these colors. I can always add back in the fish or the lilies. And I like to be creating a painting um, with the bigger areas blocked in first. Now, you're also keeping uh, composition in mind because you don't want to draw the eye to too many places. If you look at your finished painting, your brightest light is in that lower left-hand corner, and the reflections on the light are not nearly as bright over on the right side. Is that That's obviously very intentional, yes? Yeah, it's really intentional. And even in the video, I talk, well, both videos, I talk about, I don't have a focal point, which is kind of, I mean, I still remember I was at a show and the judge had given me an award and um, we were talking and he's like, so there were three of us and we couldn't decide like where your focal point was. And I realized I had not thought about that until that point in the painting. And I said to him, does it matter? And he's like, well, no, we gave you an award. But <laughs> I like, I like, I just thought it was really funny because I, I mean, it was kind of a moment of shock. I was like, oh, should I make one up? And then I was like, no, I just got to say what's in my head, you know, better be truthful. In that case, just say the truth, right? What's he yeah. going to do? Take it away. <laughs> And um, I like this idea because uh, basically your eye can move around the painting. Everything should have areas of dominance and subordination. And there should always be 
a, a path that the eye travels through, which you were noticing, Eric, in the, of the or painting. And I like to keep my options open. I don't like to be locked in. Anytime I get locked into something, that's why this is such a crazy abstract start. It almost mm -hmm. looks like nothing until something is really starting to happen. You have somebody and, watching a new, new viewer from South Africa. Hi, Leah. Uh, Margaret Sue is asking, what's the deciding factor whether to paint on the water soluble painting with the same to finish it or finish it with regular oils? In other words, why not just complete it as a whole water soluble versus adding oil on top of it? Uh, you certainly could. I used to do a lot of water mixable paintings. Um, this, uh, as I was uh, saying previously, um, I mean, I don't want to make my life more complicated than it needs to be, but uh, this is a little creamier. In my experience, this is M. Graham paint, which I think of it as like um, butter on an 80 to 90 degree day. And, and for those in foreign countries, that's like hot, like really hot. <laughs> and um, well, and it's, it's got walnut oil in it. <clears throat> yeah, it has walnut oil. oil. And so it's just, there's a longer dry time. And that's what I really like is being able to squish and scrape and move the paint around. It's snowing in Santa Fe, according to Joanna Arnett. Yikes. Oh, hi, Joanna. <laughs> I don't know if it's snowing in South Africa. Probably not, I'm guessing. Is it snowing in Egypt? <laughs> Uh, so there's another misconception that happens with water, which is that things are really blue and things are really dark. And that's kind of a phenomena from that iPhone. And notice I'm warming this up. Um, I had a discussion with a friend that I, I have my handy water reflects less than. So we looked at the example of the bright red reflects less red. And if I step over here, you could see in my painting there's bright green in the background and it's reflecting less green in the water. The super dark in the back is reflecting less dark. This is a, this is a weird one for people to wrap their heads around, but imagine like a, a hull of a black boat and a hull of a white boat. And if you look at those, ref I mean, just go out and look at those reflections. And what you're gonna see is that the white boat is gonna reflect a little bit gray and the black boat is also gonna reflect a little bit gray. So they're both less than their originality. And I've so, always heard that you, you take your darks are actually gonna be darker in a reflection, but it doesn't appear to be what you're saying. Nope, not true. I mean, just go out and look. Of course, there's always, and, and I know it's like, well, gosh, Christine's just saying that. Everybody's going to rush out and go look at a dock now, but it's... Yeah, come on over, everybody. I'm looking out right now. <laughs> yeah, Eric, you have a great example. Uh, it's pretty amazing when you start looking at it, and uh, there will be some freak examples, like with sunset or sunrise or sometimes the sun, but, but predominantly 99% of the time this is going to be happening, and the photo won't show it to you. You have well, to that's look. That's why it's important to get out and do plein air painting. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, it's, uh, I have another example here. Beautiful spring day in Johannesburg. So, oh, yay. Yes, please put that in the trunk of my car. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that the water reflections here, I mean, this is where I'm going, that uh, I know there's a little bit of glare, but um, that sky is reflecting darker. Yep. And also where you could start seeing underneath the water and um, over where the pine, the, the heavy shadowed pine tree is reflecting lighter. So it's, and all of a sudden, don't, don't be concerned if you're like, yeah, what, wait, what did she say first? You know, it's, I, I just think of it as it reflects less. So all of the pine trees are reflecting a little bit lighter. That super, the chip of this light sky is all reflecting a little bit darker. I mean, then it gets pretty easy. Okay, excellent. All right, uh, so if, you've got about, you got about 15, 15 minutes, maybe oh, 20. Okay. okay. I was gonna say the, um, I talk extensively about the water reflections in my video when I'm painting that scene. And then in the uh, sparkle 
video, I talk a lot about um, organizing your, you know, just see different ways of seeing your painting and getting it organized. And um, everybody's going to see that at three o'clock. So definitely check it out. And I'll be working in watercolor for just super quick studies. It's a great method for doing that. I'll also sometimes just paint with a paper towel. I I do use brushes, but usually it gets smaller at that point. Okay. For, for working with brushes. How are we doing on time, Eric? You said We're doing minutes. fine. You've probably got about 15 minutes. Okay. No pressure. <laughs> I know. Just do a 30 by 40 in 15 minutes. <laughs> Julia says your Sparkle DVD is fabulous. One of my all-time favorites. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, Thank you, you so much. Sure. I really, it's great to get emails from, you know, people who have watched the video and I really try to break it down. Mail it um, to her and she'll autograph it for you. You bet. <laughs> So uh, uh, also, you, you're using a lot of paper towel as, as a mixing tool. I am. And um, I have a lot of brushes here. So another thing with the solvent-free method and using traditional paints is um, these brushes were in the freezer. And so I, I have a lot of big brushes that I work with. And in the time-lapse video of the start, you saw me working. I mean, I sometimes use a house brush. Um, but you know, I'm not, I'm also not worried about getting paint on me because it doesn't have solvent and no pigment can migrate into your skin. The, the solvent could, but not the pigment. So I would just wash my hands after it's fine. And then I could always clean this with walnut oil if I needed to. But meanwhile, I just have kind of a light, medium, dark brush and that's pretty much all I need. Okay, alert me, alert, light, medium, and dark brush. That's a good one to put in the comments, somebody. And you said you had your brush in the freezer. Is that because you hadn't had time to clean it? Well, then you don't need to clean it. So, I, again, I, I don't use Gamsol, and this is traditional you don't oil. Even use, so. You don't use anything to clean your brushes other than oil. <laughs> well, think about it. How many people have said that no isolated color in, uh, to have harmony in your painting my, my paintings used to be kind of discordant and loud and a little bit garish. And all of a sudden I realized that I could have this color migration happening by not cleaning my brushes. So there's micro amounts of every color and every mix that I have. You okay. just use a lot of paint. I mean, I don't, can you see the amount of paint that I have on there? Yeah. yeah. This is one of my medium brushes. So sometimes I have a warm and cool medium brush. Other times I just change. I mean, if I wipe this off and load it with paint, You'll see this in the video, you know, the brush is just like going on and it just does its job. Treat it kind of like a shovel for putting yeah. on paint. It's fascinating to me to hear all the different approaches on this because, you know, some some artists are like, you never want to mix the, you know, the paints. You want really clean colors. Others are like, no, you want the colors to intersect. So it's really fascinating to me. I, I think as far as I'm concerned, I never want to clean clean another brush as long as I live. <laughs> you know, isn't that that's that's pretty uh, you know intoxicating thought there, right? Yeah. Do you put your uh, palette in the freezer so you don't have to, your paints go dry? Definitely, you could do that as well. Yeah. Um, let me talk a little bit here about warm and cool colors. So the upright plane or the the forested plane, I'll probably even add some warmer color in here. And so this green is always going to be warmer because it's an upright plane. And then this, which is a vertical plane, is going to be catching some of the ambient blue of the sky. And so that way I could use a cooler color here for these lily pads. And I'll, I'll change a lot of this, but this block in, this is what I wanted to show everybody, this block in, the cadence of the blue, and some of these shapes that are reflecting. I have a new viewer from Sweden. Hello, Clint.
you know, you can also put your palate underwater if, if it's oil. I, Camille Preswatic taught me that trick. She uh, sometimes would put it in the freezer, but she just put slips it in water. And, and water. Then, and then uh, water, you know, water and oil don't mix. I know that's the biggest thing with the water mixable oil is you just have to get over that hurdle. They've they've done things to modify the molecule. And guess what? Science can be on your side. This is a case where science can be on your side. They yep. figured out something good and new. And these have been around for 30 years. So, yeah. And different manufacturers use different, um, I guess, binders or so, maybe it's not binders, but some of them use uh, essentially soap and water and others use a, uh, a, a different material. So you want to try them all and see which one that you like. And they, they all paint a little differently. Even brand right. some use uh, some use a modified molecule. So they yeah. actually split parts of the molecule to make it yeah. bind with a, a viscous object like water. Yeah. I mean, think of mayonnaise. It's that's something that has egg as a binder. So some use a binder some use a surfactant and some modify the molecule. Okay. I talked to a lot of scientists that I wrote a blog for OPA. You can find the link on my website under articles. And um, it, there has been studies that have been done on these water mixable oils and um, the Getty Museum and the Smithsonian did a study on that. And, uh, you know, they've been around for a while and they keep perfecting it. So that's good yeah. news for us. Joanna asked me, will I be using water soluble oils on my Russia trip? No, I take I, I take oils. As a matter of fact, I love the Russian paints. And so I use that as an opportunity before I go. I'll, I, when I first get there, I'll buy a bunch of Russian paints. And uh, I, I bought like 60 tubes and brought it back with me when I was there in March. Uh, so you've got about uh, maybe seven minutes left. OK. Yeah. That's a big painting. It's it's hard to, to teach all this in that amount of time. Well, I also thought it would be fun to talk about the idea of a commission and how do you make a piece from, um, here's a, this is a gouache study that I did. Lovely. And you can see that same idea of the colors happening in the water. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, I have different studies here that, that show that and help me stay on track with uh, how the water is reflecting. Gouache is the, the hot new new thing. People are really yeah. into it. So is there going to end up being another layer on top of this? Um, I'll continue to modify a lot of this. Um, and as far as the color goes, uh, usually I spend a lot of time on the junction between, uh, which is the water line, the, the water surface and then reality. So I usually spend a lot of time. I think of it as the horizontal plane and the vertical plane where that meets up. I mean, there's, there's a lot of work to be done there. And um, that also can be a point of drama or sparkle where you have a lot of high contrast there. This is so much fun. I love my life. <laughs> just, just sitting here watching people paint. I mean, this, it doesn't get better than this. I agree. Oh, also, I should mention that um, a friend of mine suggested this. I thought he was crazy at first. But so I have this big painting, and I have a smaller studio. So anybody who has a smaller studio, here's a big tip for you. Um, the, and also, because of my studio being small, I don't have as much wall space, but um, I have a mirror directly behind me, and I would say I have about 10 feet, so it's wall to wall, and I can look in the mirror, and it helps, it's a big mirror, and it helps me to see my painting always in reverse, and so I'll do a paint stroke, check it out, do a paint stroke, check it out. I mean, there's already things that I see because I could look at it. Um, smaller on the monitor. Um, my mirror kind of has a lot of camera clutter here, but that's a really good tip to have a mirror directly behind you as you paint. Absolutely. I have a big one right behind me as well. And I, I put my paper towels in the back of the room 
because it reminds me to step back. But in your case, you can't step back very far. I, I don't have a lot of room either, so I've got about maybe 12 feet. In this particular room, I have more room, but I don't paint in here. Well, I'll also take off my glasses to paint. I'm um, somewhat nearsighted, and uh, so if I take off my glasses, everything is fuzzy, and that helps me a lot. So you it's know, very I, I love your point about the vertical and horizontal plane. You know, that just oh. it's it's a, a great thing to reinforce. Those lily pads are reflecting the tops. Uh, top of the sky makes a lot of sense yeah and here i just want to establish that this is lighter again that has a long way to go as you could see with this with this other one here and i'm not even thinking about flowers and stuff yet and this was a red example to show how it would reflect so yeah. just... so one thing that uh one thing you could do is when when you finish this painting if you'll come back to this Facebook page where we did the broadcast and post it in the comments. That would be very helpful. Oh yeah, I would love to do that. All right, terrific. Uh, so this idea of working really big and then going smaller, plus um, I, I would say too, the fish need to be integrated a lot. And um, let's see, uh, one thing that I'll do just to get rid of like some of the bumpy, lumpy things happening with the paint is just to kind of knock everything down a little bit. It creates some abstraction and just some merging of some of the things that are happening in the, the painting. It's important just to not treat it so preciously. And Yeah. You don't um, use any kind of an air filter in your studio, I assume, because you're not using any solvents. It's one of the questions. Yeah, I'm just painting solvent free. I'm doing direct painting. And yeah. that, that way I could I, I can use my hands. I, I don't worry about the fumes. Uh, if it's cold months and I can't open the doors. I mean, and, and in fact, um, oil paint itself is not toxic. It's only if you're using some of the cadmiums or cobalts and you would eat something then you're going to be in trouble or you have a hangnail it could migrate into your system but uh, the paint fumes are not toxic but it's just oil that is oxidizing that's all that's happening when paint dries and so if you don't have that by if you delete solvent um that's the thing where the vapors where you should really right. you know have error or like you said eric a filter right you're painting on a canvas not a board is that right this is a Centurion linen canvas that's okay. been pre-stretched. All right. Okay. And is that oil primed? Uh, no. It's uh, all media primed. All media it's, primed. Okay. It's not really acrylic primed. All media primed. The gesso has a different grabby coat to it. Okay. And uh, so it's it's a different thing where the oil prime. I've worked on oil prime too. It's just a little. I don't know. I don't like the surface as much. So okay. this works better for me. Yeah. One thing you cannot put anything acrylic on top of oil. You could put oil on top of acrylic. Uh, so I'll be curious to learn more about the all media priming. Excellent. So we've got, let's say I'll give you another two minutes and then I'm going to drop you out of here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No offense. I would love to do two hours, but, you know, I, I yeah, got to get something done. So here's, uh, here's where I could start putting in some darks, and you can see in relation to the water now, uh, this dark is starting, I, I would restate the edge of the land mass versus the water mass. And there's plenty of time to do things with the water lilies here. Um, often what happens with water lilies is you have like a darker kind of rim around them. So I might be thinking of something like that to just kind of start having them lift off. Um, if they pop from the surface, that's going to happen. All right. Well, Christine, this is this has been fascinating. You're doing a fabulous job. We're anxious to see the the final piece when you get to it, 
and uh, there's so yep, much to do. It's a, it's a big project. 